Dragon's Dogma 2 is a game that emphasizes freedom and discovery, but with this comes a lot of things that the game doesn't tell you and leaves you to discover on your own. And some of these things you might not even know existed. So today we're going to be going over the ultimate beginner's guide to get you your best foot forward with no story spoilers whatsoever. And a lot of these tips are going to come in extremely handy, not only at the beginning of the game, but throughout your entire playthrough as well. The first major choices you're going to need to make is your character creation and your initial vocations for your Arisen and your Pawn. And there's a lot of things in here that the game doesn't actually tell you especially with character creation, which we'll get into in a second. You initially have the choice between fighter, archer, mage, or thief, but you will only be stuck with your first vocation choice until you reach the first small settlement where you will be able to switch between them, where you will be able to easily switch between them. Now, there's a reason that you're going to actually want to level up multiple vocations. For my pawn, I've leveled up thief to max, and I'm starting to level warrior. And the reason for this is the augmentations. Each vocation has its own augmentations that you can learn. For instance, for warrior, I currently have access to vitality and impact. Vitality is going to increase our maximum health, but even though I currently have my pawn equipped with warrior, I can not only equip warrior augments, but I can also choose any of the augments that I unlocked on my rogue vocation for my pawn. This allows you to level up multiple vocations and to be able to further customize your arisen and pawns pretty significantly with various augmentations. So don't feel too pressured to choose one vocation that you need to use for your entire playthrough, and feel free to switch between to unlock various augmentations and choose which one you enjoy the most. Now during character creation, the game doesn't tell you that the height and weight of your character is actually pretty important. Now your height is going to dictate your character's movement speed, and this is its jog speed, not the sprint speed, which means the speed at which your character will move without consuming any stamina. So all characters are going to sprint the same speed, but when you're in the open world, this jog speed can vary pretty significantly depending on your character's height. These stats are relative to a medium height, which means right in the middle. A tall character will have an increased jog speed of 9%. A very tall character will have an increase of plus 23%. A short character will have negative 8% jog speed, and a very short character will have a negative 17% jog speed. Now the height of your character also has something to do with how much your character will weigh. Now if you didn't know this, and you still want to optimize your character's height and weight and carrying capacity, you can actually edit your character and pawn once you get to the first major city. Once you get to Vernworth, you're going to want to head to the Grand Riftstone of Vermund. This is a large building that you really cannot miss. And if you head into this building, to the left is going to be a shopkeep where you can buy these Art of Metamorphosis. This is 500 RC. So far, this is the only NPC I've seen that sells these and the only has two of them. If we purchase one of these, we can head outside of this building to the left and we're going to run around this corner and right up the stairs. We need to take this to a barber shop. And this one is right nearby inside of this building here, which is the Clovis Barbie. And if we talk to this fine young lady, we can select to modify appearance and we can choose either our Arisen or our main pawn. <clears throat> now, before we hop into this, we should look over a few different things. Our stamina is currently at 902. Our height is at 200 centimeters, weight at 109, and our max encumbrance at 68.65 kilograms. Now, when we go to edit our character in the detailed customization, we can adjust our height for the movement speed if we so desire, but you'll notice that the height is also going to dictate how much our character weighs. A character of very tall height is going to weigh a lot. All of these sliders are going to have an effect on your character's weight. Now, the numbers on screen are how weight affected your character in Dragon's Dogma 1, and it seems to be very similar in Dragon's Dogma 2, at least with the different weight tiers. A character that weighs above is not going to get any change to the carrying capacity or stamina recovery. So even if we boosted our character up to like 150 plus weights, we're actually not going to see an increase in our encumbrance carrying capacity. So 109 is what you're going to target for the maximum carrying capacity. And anything you go below 109 weight is going to decrease your carrying capacity, but also increase your stamina recovery. We'll notice that unlike in Dragon's Dogma 1, our stamina is going to stay exactly the same. So our weight is no longer going to dictate an increase or decrease to our actual stamina, but it will have a pretty significant change to our stamina recovery. We also went from almost 69 maximum encumbrance 
all the way down to 49. So this is a pretty significant decrease in the amount of items that we can carry. So essentially what you want to do is you want to balance your height and weight to how much you want to actually be able to carry in the game. And there are various things that you can get to increase your encumbrance when you're playing through the game as well, but it's certainly something to keep in mind when you're making your character. Now speaking of your weight encumbrance, managing your inventory in Dragon's Dogma 2 is incredibly important. You really want to maximize how much time you have out in the open world to be able to explore, and there is so much to find. Every nook and cranny is going to have something, whether it is a collectible fruit to be able to craft potions, or one of the many chests that are scattering the world with weapons and armor inside of them, and all of these are going to add up to a lot of weight over time about the way items spoil and the potential uses that they still have. What I highly recommend doing is anytime you have the chance, make sure to go to an innkeep in any town that you go to. You're gonna have the ability to organize your storage. Here you can deposit and withdraw and or combine items within this inventory. There is absolutely no reason to be carrying a ton of items on you at all times that are just going to be weighing you down and preventing you from exploring the world to its fullest. All of these crafting materials like copper, all the ores that you're going to be able to find, the skins, venom sacks, talons, all of this stuff can always be inside of this storage because there is actually the ability to craft from storage in this game. So you never need any of these things on your person ever. The only time you will is if you actually need to sell something then you'll need to put it back into your inventory, which means you can withdraw how many you want, and then you can go and sell it. Otherwise, you're going to want to keep your inventory relatively empty at all times. The only things I really recommend keeping on you are things like fairy stones, maybe a wake stone if you're going to be fighting something extremely difficult, any permits that you need to access any special areas, and the salbarius draughts, I mispronounced the bejesus out of that, which is a healing potion, and just a variety of healing potions and things like that, but not too many of them because you really shouldn't need a lot, especially if you have a healer in your party. We'll get a little bit more into that in just a second, but there is one other thing that's extremely important with inventory management, and that is that items spoil over time. Whenever you get an item for the first time, the majority of the time they're just going to be a regular item like this quince here probably mispronounced that as well. Then you have the ripened version. So it goes from regular to ripened to spoiled. I know this is a potato right here that's spoiled, but you get the idea. Now, regular fruits can be crafted into the healing potions. Now, ripened fruits can be crafted into dried fruit. Now, this is very important. Dried fruit is going to make a different type of item, which is extremely powerful. So you want to keep an eye on the items that are spoiling within your inventory. When they get to ripened, you're going to want to craft them into their dried versions which is going to prevent them from spoiling. Now, even if an item does spoil, which you're going to have happen a lot if you're not paying attention to your inventory at all times, they do still have a use. You can actually craft them into lantern oil, which you're going to need to explore caves and any dark areas if you're exploring a lot at night. So items always have a use, but you're definitely going to want to prevent things from spoiling as much as possible because you really only need so much lantern oil. So the main thing is to always craft your stuff into potions. So you're not wasting any of your potential resources. If you can't craft them into potions, wait for them to ripen and then dry them. And then once they're dried, what you can do is you can turn them into Roberin. Now let's talk about save games in Dragon's Dogma 2. This is very, very important, especially if you don't want to lose progress or you want to be able to revert progress. There are two different ways you can save data in the game. You can do a manual save. You can save and continue or save and return to the title screen. This is going to create a new manual save, but there is a problem with this because not only is this a manual save, but this is also your auto save file. So anytime you are running around town or progressing quest lines, your manual save will be overwritten no matter what by your automatic saves as well. So this means if you make a decision you do not like, you are stuck with that decision. And I actually really love that about the game. Now the only other way to avoid this is to go to an inn. Anytime that you rest at an inn, inns have this sign with the little fire on it. You can pay to rest at the inn and this will create a new save called a restore from last in rest. So if you haven't rested at an inn in say 20 hours and you click that button, you will then go back in time 20 hours into your gameplay and you will not be able to go back because when you load into the game, it will actually autosave, so then you lose your manual save and your previous autosaves, and you're going to be stuck back at that in rest. So if I save and return to the title screen, I can better show you what I'm talking about. We have load from last save. This is going to be either a manual save or an autosave. It can be either or, whatever happened last. And then load from last in rest. 
This is an in arrest. So this is a way that you can actually have a way to kind of go back in time. Before you make any major decisions in the game, I highly recommend resting at an inn, and then you can always restore back to that save if you need to or want to make a different decision. So managing this inn rest is incredibly important. Now as you progress through the game, you will also gain the ability to acquire your own houses. You can purchase these or get them through quests. This will count as an inn rest as well. If you go to the bed, you can sleep inside of this bed, and this will also count as a free inn rest, and you can restore to this point as well. So you can either go to an inn or go to a house that you own, and this will create that inn rest save game for you. Now you will also find campsites throughout the game, where you can use camping kits to be able to rest at these. Now I cannot express this more clearly, campsites do not count as inn rests. I actually lost six hours of my gameplay because of this mistake, a campsite rest does not count as an in rest according to these save games. You will get a new auto save, but you will not get a new end rest from sleeping at a campsite. So those are the ways that you currently have to be able to manage your saves. So make sure to utilize them to the best of your ability. Now there are over 1000 NPCs with their own stories, motivations, and impacts upon the world of Dragon's Dogma 2. The thing that I love most about this game is that a lot of these side quests and characters actually will impact the outcome of your playthrough. They'll have impacts between the relationships of your character, other characters throughout the story, and many different things can transpire. And you never know if an NPC is going to be important or not, so your decisions really do matter. For instance, this guy right here looks like just a regular NPC that's just kind of here for no reason. This guy with a bow here, if we stand here long enough, will actually activate a new side quest. And that's the type of things that happens in Dragon's Dogma 2. So I don't want to give you any spoilers, but what I can say is pay attention to the world, immerse yourself in it, and you will be rewarded. Now when you get to your first camp in the game, you're going to have the ability to summon your own pawn. And I recommend going back into that riftstone and making sure to recruit two other pawns as well. When you go into a riftstone, you'll be able to recruit various other player pawns that are in the world. If they are at or near your level, they won't cost anything to recruit. If they are higher level, they will cost more to be able to recruit. You get this currency called RC, which you can use to recruit pawns. You'll get this currency if your pawns are used or throughout different types of ways throughout your gameplay. Now at the beginning of the game, depending on what vocation you're choosing, I definitely recommend having a mage. The mages will be able to heal you and do quite a bit of damage. And having something like an archer in your party will also help. I recommend having a variety of vocations in your party. But I really don't want to spoil this too much for you because experimenting with it is half the fun. But definitely having a mage, whether it's your pawn or another player pawn or your own character, is definitely going to help at the beginning of the game. Now there is so much more to cover in Dragon's Dogma 2, but today I really just wanted to cover some beginner tips to really help you get yourself into the game and having fun. I'll be covering far more content on the channel in the future, so feel free to subscribe for more, and hopefully I'll see you all in the next one.